Dan Porterfield, President and CEO of the Aspen Institute. Uh, I'm so excited that this group is gathered together for our panel discussion on the threatened guardians of the earth. Also uh, extra excited that our chair, Jim Crown, is here today. Jim, thank you for all you do for the Aspen Institute. And um, the topic is a, a big one, important, uh, uh, challenging, uh, and, and highly relevant to the world we live in. Uh, these, there is an essential and often perilous role that indigenous peoples play in protecting and preserving our planet at the same time that they are dealing with the 21st century manifestations of centuries long oppression uh, and marginalization and even genocide. And so how do we think about this role that indigenous communities play in helping us understand what is at stake in our world and at the same time acknowledge and address all of the challenges and imbalances and injustices of how power has expressed itself over the years. That is a big topic. I also would like to open the program before introducing uh, our colleagues by uh, re reminding all that we are on the historic lands of the Ute people, uh, a thriving community that has given so much to this region and to our world. We honor that tradition and heritage today. So we're joined today by two leaders who have worked hand in hand with indigenous communities uh, in, in a variety of ways, not, not only limited to climate issues. Uh, the first is Carla Fredericks, who is CEO of the Christensen Fund, where she supports indigenous people's rights, dignity, and self-determination. She's provided support to the UN Special Rapporteur on rights of indigenous peoples, served as counsel to the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe in opposition to the Dakota Access Pipeline, assisted the Maya of Southern Belize in affirming their land rights, developed a model for indigenous-driven consent processes and remedy, and that sounds incredibly important and fascinating. She's also been a faculty member at the University of Colorado Law School, um, and so thank you, Carla, for joining us today. Please join me in welcoming Carla. Uh, and then uh, to her left is Peter Seligman, who is co-founder and CEO of Neotero, a joint venture of the Emerson Collective, the MacArthur Foundation, the Mulago Foundation, and Conservation International, where he works alongside indigenous peoples and local communities to secure their rights, cultures, and well-being. Peter is also the co-founder and former CEO and board chair of Conservation International, which is a global nonprofit working in more than 40 nations to sustainably care for nature. And our colleague who leads our advancement, uh, Cynthia McKee, worked side by side with Peter to help build the organization. And, uh, and Cynthia now is playing that same role with us, which we're excited about. Lastly, one more introduction. Nikki Petrie is here in the front row. Nikki is the leader of the Aspen Institute's uh, Center for Native American Youth, extraordinary set of programs and relationships, youth-centered, community-centered, that is making a huge difference all across the country in indigenous communities, and also in a big way at the Aspen Institute, as we ourselves adapt how we work learning from Nikki and her, and her youth team. Um, so let's start off with a big, general, welcome, introduction kind of question. You're both working at the intersection of climate, health of the planet, dignity and well-being of indigenous communities. Tell us what you do and tell us how you work, the methods you've developed to, in, in order to pursue the work you do. And maybe Carla? Sure. Um, so the foundation that I run, the Christensen Fund, has a long history in the climate conservation and biodiversity sector. And as a result, um, a long and deep connectivity with indigenous communities throughout the globe. And um, given that our work has always touched indigenous communities, um, when the Christensen Fund decided to refine strategy for this century, um, they really looked to um, indigenous people as a guide for how to do this work um, in a holistic way, inclusive of, of all the different um, realities that communities face and, and the realities that the planet is facing. And so we've refined our strategy now to focus exclusively on indigenous people. Um, and our mission now is to simply um, support the uh, protection of indigenous people's rights, dignity, and self-determination. And we'll talk more about um, the self-determination piece this, um, this afternoon. 
Um, that's really the core component of our work that has emerged, um, really looking to communities to self-determine their own priorities as to how they're going to deal with the intersecting crises they face. Um, thank you, Carla. Um, Peter? Well, thank you first for the opportunity and the invitation to be here. Uh, Neotero uh, was launched in 2018, and it was created by a group of people, indigenous and non-indigenous, uh, just to, to look at this intersection that we are living through of, of addressing social justice issues and, uh, and caring for and cherishing this earth, uh, the planet. And uh, when we created the organization, um, it really was uh, in response to, to uh, the reality that a third of this earth is under the guardianship of indigenous peoples. And on that third of the earth are half of the forests of the planet, 80% of the biological diversity, and the cultures that have been caring for them and stewarding and cherishing them are cultures that are resilient and have a special relationship with this place, a reciprocal relationship. And so we thought we should be supporting them um, in a way that makes us strong allies of their self-determined efforts to secure culture, health, well-being, and territory. And our focus really is on those uh, collective communities that are collectively cherishing their territory, whether it's across the Amazon, the Boreal Farce, uh, the Pacific, uh, Turtle Island, wherever it might be, the Sami territories uh, across uh, uh, Northern Europe and into the Soviet Union, into Russia. Um, and so we decided in the very beginning that the only way for us to be uh, effective is to have an organization that's polycultural. And so the majority of our board members and the chair are indigenous. Uh, a minority are non-indigenous. Same with the staff and the team. And the idea is we need to be trusted in both places, listen carefully, and see that we can bridge this relationship and elevate a real respect and support and, uh, and commitment uh, to cherish, value, follow the wisdom of indigenous cultures in taking care of this place. Oh, beautiful, thank you. Mm -hmm. So let, let me start with a framing issue. Um, centuries and centuries of oppression, genocide, marginalization, invisibility, um, co-optation, whatever else. Um, you both are working within that context. It's not like we have a clean slate here and we're now we're you know, um, gonna start, start something from fre fresh. There's a patterns and practices that have you know, defined the world that we have. How do you think think about that, how do you want those that want to support and engage your work to think about that? Mm -hmm. Maybe again, start with Carla? Sure. Um, we talked about this a bit in our planning conversation and really making sure that we were contextualizing um, the work that we're doing and, and the ideas that we'll have today um, to really honor the, the, this long history that indigenous peoples have, have faced but also not just thinking about the centuries of oppression as a result of colonization and the current moment that's really um, toward decolonization of, of these institutions and, and, um, and, and state governments and so on, but really about the resilience of indigenous peoples. As Peter mentioned, um, you know, I certainly wouldn't be sitting here if it weren't for the resilience of my ancestors, the, the, the will to survive, persevere, and to do so in a way that is really consistent with our, our you know, traditions that we've had since time immemorial. And so that deep, stubborn, resistant um, resilience and, the, and also the, the real um, commitment to the values that we have um, of reciprocity with the earth, of relationship with the earth, um, that, that's the underpinning of everything. Yeah. And, um, it would be very simple to sit up here and, and, and tell you all of the pitiful statistics that um, indigenous land defenders face, and, and particularly frontline defenders, which we'll talk about in a while. But there's a, there's a very large ecosystem of work happening here, and, and this is a very important part of it that we'll talk about today that, um, that, that is of crucial importance. But the other part to remember is that 
you know, we have folks from the Center for Native American Youth sitting here that are deeply invested in a, in a powerful and resilient future for all of us. And, and that work needs to be honored and, and thought about as well alongside those statistics. One, before I go to Peter, one follow-up. Um, I, I want to say a quick follow-up, but I know the answer that you'd want to give will take, could take a long time. So, maybe, <laughs> uh, so something that Nikki and, and I and our colleagues have talked about a lot, especially in working with youth, is the idea of generational trauma mm -hmm. and how important it is for those of us whose privilege includes that we have not had generational trauma as part of our identities, to try to understand that which we haven't ourselves experienced. Mm -hmm. And of course, generational trauma in indigenous communities may, may resemble other forms of generational trauma, those that have had the experience of being enslaved or perhaps other migrants. How do you think about generational trauma? And even more, maybe more relevant, how can people like me that want to be allies understand what generational trauma is? Yeah, I mean, for those of you who don't know, there is a significant amount of scientific research that talks about um, interge intergenerational trauma. And it's really the trauma that we carry actually on strands of our DNA um, when, we, when communities and, and families and others have experienced oppression and genocide and that sort of thing. And certainly, Native American communities are in that category, as are other communities. And it's something that I think um, deserves a relevant level of awareness yeah. when working with indigenous peoples, and particularly when we're thinking about um, the role of indigenous peoples as having you know, significant levels of knowledge that can really um, help with um, the pressing problems that we face in climate and otherwise, that, um, that it really can't be an extractive approach, it has right. to be an approach that is really um, about recognizing the history and, and the current reality of these communities that are tangling with intergenerational trauma alongside intergenerational wisdom. Um, yeah. Intergenerational trauma is one side of the coin and intergenerational wisdom is the other and they're both equally powerful. Beautiful. So I, I think just having, you know, as an indigenous person, like one of our key aspects of our cosmology is embracing the reality of, of multiple things at the same time. It is not one, it is not the other, it is both. Um, and, and I think that that's the important awareness that people Thank need to so bring. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. The, uh, so the question that I started with was, uh, how, do you, how do you work, how does your organization work with the acknowledgement of the centuries of oppression? Um, and is there anything you want to add to what, we, what uh, Carla just said? Having an organization that um, is made up of such a remarkable diversity of cultures so the 13 board members, seven are indigenous, the chair is indigenous, they all come from different cultures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then there's a group of non-indigenous peoples. Then there's COVID. Mm -hmm. And then there's a challenge of actually how do you learn to listen to each other, hear each other, know each other, and, uh, and learn from each other. So, so it really comes from a commitment to deep listening. And when you think about deep listening, um, what I have learned most significantly from the work that I've had the opportunity I've had of working with all multiple cultures from around the world, indigenous peoples, and the way that they communicate, the collective decision making, the time it takes, the respect for different yeah. seasons, um, is that um, um, they seem to have a really interesting commonality of foundational commitment to a reciprocal place, to a reciprocal relationship with all other beings. Uh, that tree is my sister, and the caribou that I'm about to eat is a relative, and I give thanks in relation to that. That's not just one culture. Yeah. The culture that seems to be missing that is our culture, but that's a different lens. Yeah. And I think that the most important thing that we have learned as an entity that is so diverse in culture is um, that we place reciprocity as our North Star or our Southern Cross. And that's the common ag agreement of all the people that are working there. And that means that um, uh, we do not ever enter a place with a solution. We always enter a place if we're invited to listen. 
And, and I think that that's, you know, that's really essential. That's a different way to do things. It's not natural for a Western culture to do that. Yeah. I mean, we normally go in, we got the answer, we like to give it to you. Yeah. And of course, the process of doing that means that we learn a lot. We build trust and friendship. We invite each other to our homes. It takes time. Um, we, we, we trust. And I think that that's the most important thing. The request to us from our partners is trust us. Mm -hmm. And we do. Mm -hmm. Just um, picking up yeah. on that, as a philanthropic institution, um, you know, there's been a long history with philanthropy of coming in and being in spaces like this and then coming back to the office and figuring out outcomes and evaluations and strategies. And we have really stripped down on all of that and embraced what is now being called trust-based philanthropy. And it's, it's really critical if you're going to support self-determination for indigenous communities to practice trust-based philanthropy because there frankly isn't another way. Um, if you don't trust the self-determination of the communities to decide what it is that they would like to allocate resources to, then you're really um, at, at you know, opposite ends of, of what it is you say you'd like to be doing. This is something we've learned in our organization, and Nikki's been a partner very much in this, as our programs seek to collaborate, that we, we also have to slow down our desire mm -hmm. to you know, be allies, be supporters, be solvers of problems. Uh, much more reciprocity within our own within our methods, which we're learning. You know, we're we're le leaning into it and learning. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, we probably will get to this at some point, but I think that it's it's really worthy since we're talking about how we relate to each other in different cultures. Uh, many of the places in the communities that we work with, the indigenous peoples we work with, are under immediate threat today. One of our colleagues, so we work and have worked in a place called the Valle de Javari Valley. Yep. Mm -hmm. The Valle de Javari is the northwestern corner of Brazil, north of it is Colombia, west is Peru. Uh, it's about the size of Portugal. There are 15, at least 15 uncontacted tribal communities there. And the president of Brazil basically said, we're gonna take that territory. He lost a constitutional battle with the Supreme Court, defended by indigenous lawyers, first time. They beat, they were recognized by the Supreme Court, they won their case. And then the president said, I lost the case, but we're gonna look the other way, invaders enter. Miners, fishermen, loggers, attacking, murdering peoples. And about two weeks ago, probably many of you have read about this, um, um, a British journalist named um, Dom Phillips for The Guardian went into the area with a man that worked with us named Bruno Pereira, and they were both assassinated. Um, and the president said, you go into the Amazon, you can get lost or executed. And so now we are involved in supporting an extraordinary hero, Bruno Marubo, who was in yeah. a... a, 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 a uh, Beto Morubo, who was in the, one of the leaders there. And there are many places like that happening right now. And so, so you know, I want us to understand that, that um, this, the, the period of colonization is not over. Yeah. It's right now. It's an assault. Yeah. And so, you know, that's part of the, the urgency and the importance and yeah. that intersection of taking care of the earth and really respecting and supporting indigenous peoples that are under threat. Yeah. Well, you notice we call this the threatened guardians of the earth uh, for exactly this reason. Um, let's, let's try to look at this kind of from the both sides of it, i.e. it comes together. How are we supporting as allies indigenous leadership and respecting and responding to indigenous cosmologies, practices, ways of being and relating, and how can we, while being allies, also seek to be allies in protection or protectors? I'm not sure how you'd want to frame it, but there's sort of both sides of this. And Carla, do you, we, either side of this I would welcome your thoughts. Um, you know, just to acknowledge, I mean, the atrocity that, that Peter talked about, um, unfortunately, is not um, a terribly new phenomenon in Brazil or in Latin America. I think Brazil actually ranks second in killing human rights defenders, Colombia's first and Mexico's third. Um, and, and as I've been thinking about what happened two weeks ago, I've also been thinking about this country and, 
And what Peter's describing is really um, a, a very perilous threat to democracy um, and, a, and a threat to the rule of law. Um, we had this happen with the, the Maya people of southern Belize. Um, we had recognition of their land rights in um, the Belizean Supreme Court, in the Caribbean Court of Justice, in the Inter-American Court, um, and uh, the government ignored it. And then we had to keep going back. And um, I walked across um, an area of contested land with a bunch of lawyers from the United States, and we were greeted by um, armed militia from Guatemala holding machine guns. I mean, this is, this is perilous work um, for everyone involved. And that's just the stuff that gets headlines um, every day. You know, Center for Native American Youth has a really successful program on combating um, the violence against indigenous women. One in two indigenous women in this country will be sexually assaulted in their lifetime. Domestic partner abuse goes without any penalty, um, even despite um, statutory protections that have been issued federally. Um, and that doesn't, doesn't grab headlines. Um, our missing and murdered indigenous relatives are too many to count. While I'm sitting up here, um, you know, those statistics are happening. And so, you know, in terms of thinking about allyship and thinking about how to support this, it's really about looking at the whole picture, looking beyond the headlines, really availing yourself of, of the knowledge of what's going on in the world, and also making those connections to these broader pieces that we're seeing that do profoundly affect us, that do grab headlines. Um, and one of the other things that you know, I've been talking to indigenous relatives about, particularly my, my women elders, is you know, what happened last week in the United States Supreme Court, the overturning of Roe versus Wade, and how there are so many people that are so absolutely shocked that the bodily autonomy of individuals is not being respected. And those of us in the indigenous community are saying, that's been happening to us for, since colonization. And it's, there is this moment of coming together where we are all facing the same things, whether it's climate change, whether it is planetary destruction, whether it is the threat to democracy, the threat to rule of law, we're all in this together now. And some of the people who have experienced more privilege you know, in more recent history um, are become, becoming aware that these threats are not something that are unique to indigenous communities. That's just where it begins. And Bolsonaro's behavior, some of the behavior that we've seen in the United States, it just scales out. It starts with us. But once they get away with it with us, that's when it starts to scale. And that's the thing that I think everyone really needs to be aware of, that protecting these democratic institutions really does, I think, require awareness and allyship with indigenous communities. So uh, thank you. And let me ask you about the, the, about the possibility of building a green movement, a save the planet movement, uh, a um, reduce carbon footprint movement that connects to indigenous values and traditions and brings together uh, other cultural traditions that haven't been engaged with indigenous world in order to perhaps adopt values or mindsets or understandings that people haven't had. Is, there, is this a viable future for the, for the climate movement or is it something that is maybe on the side and good to acknowledge but not a driver of change? It's the only thing that's gonna work. I mean, if all we do is find abundant, clean, cheap energy, and we reduce the amount of CO2 we put in the atmosphere, we're not going to change our behavior towards this earth or towards other peoples. It's just, you know, a technical solution. Yeah. It is not even close to being appropriate. It's not even close no. to being enough. There is a portfolio of commitments required. And when I was in Glasgow, the thing in Glasgow that made Glasgow strong was indigenous peoples and young people. They have the power, the voice, the vote, the purchase. And what I saw there were for the first time companies actually being worried. Mm. Worried about who's gonna buy our stuff if we continue to do what we do. And I, you, and, and I think there is no solution without, and so it, it has to be at the center of this effort is core values. And the center of those core values has got to be a different lens. We cannot look at this earth and monetize her. Yeah. We have done it, we see where we are. It needs to be a, re and that's hard. I mean, part of our challenge is how do we tell the story? 
How do we elevate storytellers? Different perspectives, have them so that they're seen and heard and absorbed. What's the language that yeah. we need so we can break through? Because if we don't do that, we're lost. Yeah. And so I feel tremendous, but I want to just clearly, I want to just you know, say yeah. this one thing. When I started working in this field decades and decades ago, there was not a single school, business, or nation that was thinking about it. The good news is that they're all talking about it now. You cannot get away from it. So, so when we look at the moment of time and look at how desperate things are, we need to step back and see that there is a movement that is going to just accelerate. Yeah. And so that's why, you know, that's my kind of, as an elder, that's what I see. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you a, a follow-up question. Take us back in time. You could have done many things building on your incredible record with Conservation International. So why did you choose to found Neotero? There could have been other ways to work, A. And B, now that you've been doing it, has your perspective changed through the work? Yeah, okay. So I decided to launch Neotero. It started out from just a, a recognition. I had done work with indigenous peoples for years. Um, but when I stepped back as I was leaving CI and asked the question about how do we address climate change through nature-based solutions, a third of the solution comes from photosynthesis, from the security of nature. I asked a simple question when they came back, the staff, the science team said, this is you know, the way it's gonna work. I said, well, where are those territories? And I said, well, who controls those territories? And I was really surprised by the, 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 the fact that there's so much of the earth was under the guardianship mm -hmm. of indigenous people still. That's resilience mm -hmm. after 500 years of assault, number one. And number two, that it's not random if those territories are healthy. Mm -hmm. It relates to a culture, a perspective, a vision. And I thought, that's what has to be learned. Yeah. And so the question became, how do you build something and how do you become a really strong ally? How do you subordinate yourself to others? Mm -hmm. And how do you design that type of an entity? And that's why I went to indigenous friends and said, can you help me, can you teach us, how do we bring that team together? And that's where it began. And so that, that's why I did it. It seemed to me a missing pathway and it was, it was essential because indigenous peoples and indigenous guardians of the earth get a pittance of all the philanthropic support. It's, yeah. the, it's the crumbs. And yet they control, I believe, the wisdom and the vision of the future. So that, that's, you know, that was where it came from. It was, it was pretty simple. And then how, how, what have you learned since you started doing it? Have you, has your, have you changed at all in your, your sense of the methods that you use? Well, I learned how much I don't know, which yeah. is really important. Um, you learn the humility of, the importance of listening really carefully, the importance of, of collective thinking, the importance of getting away from top-down leadership, the importance of, of, uh, of elevating opportunity for others, of knowing when is your time to step aside and, and think about who is going to be, who will be the leaders. And, and I think the other thing that I learned that was, was really important is that it's almost a harmonic, harmonic convergence. You know, there are communities of indigenous peoples all across this planet that are connected. Yeah. And they are ready to go, they are in it. And, and, and that, I did not know how powerful that was. And so it changes your perspective as to, so what's the role that we can play? Yeah. I mean, how do we be, I've said it before, how do we become a strong ally? How do we get all those national states, those leaders, those funders to actually say, respecting the rights of indigenous peoples, free for prior informed consent are essential. It's not, the, it's not just a box to check. And how do you get the world who's thinking about how do you protect this planet to understand that indigenous guardianship of the earth is an alternative pathway for taking care of this place, yeah. as opposed to the creation of parks and protected areas, mm -hmm. which has been the tradition of conservation okay. organizations. Yeah. Thank you. Carla. I just want to acknowledge Peter for being, for really walking his walk. I'm, I'm just delighted to sit up here with him because I've watched this journey um, over the years and, and he's telling the truth about, about what he's doing and how he got there and I just, 
it gives me a lot of hope. Um, you know, you asked a question about allyship, and th th that's what it looks like. Um, and it looks like really being reflective, really thinking about seeding space, um, and humility, right? And, and I think, you know, our Western ways of being, you know, here we are sitting on this pedestal, literally. Yeah. <laughs> um, this, is, this is not a reflection of how to practice humility. <laughs> um, right? And, and the rewards in the world that we work in are not rewards for humility. And, and I think if you talk to indigenous folks, um, you know, it's really, it's really standing in that humility, standing in the humility that, of knowing how very um, dependent we are on others and on nature and on our mother earth that, that really guides our way of thinking. And so um, the allyship piece is just so critical to that because this is the world that we live in. These, this is, these are the structures of power in which um, we need to work in order to, to persevere at this time. And so I just, I just really acknowledge that. I, I think it's, it's beautiful. One of the, you both have reminded me of a, a colleague in an earlier stage of my career. I did a lot of work with human rights leaders, and one's name was Samuel Kofi Woods, who was an extraordinary leader in Liberia. And he, he took on Charles Taylor. And that wasn't an easy one, um, and suffered a lot of consequences. And one time I was working with him on his memoir, and I asked him the question, well, why? And he said, basically, he said, there are times when good must confront evil. And by evil, he meant Taylor in particular, but actually the structures and forces, less the person. Good must confront evil. Uh, because at some point, if you don't confront it, it, won't, it will not stop itself. And does that resonate at all? Are there forces here that must be confronted through your work? I mean, I was brought up to understand that my being in the world was something that was very much centered in responsibility. That when you come into this world, you have a responsibility to your family, you have a responsibility to your communities, and you have a responsibility to make the world better than how you came into it. And I think that that's, that's also a strand that you find in yeah. indigenous communities. And I don't know if I would really embrace a good versus evil yeah. binary around all of this. I think that people have their unique motivations for what they're going to do. And I came away from Glasgow really thinking, you know, we're not facing an environmental crisis, we're facing a deep social crisis. And, and how do we really under, understand deeply what is motivating the behavior to do the things that we're doing, and how do we solve for those things? Because I don't think if you ask somebody, you know, who's poor and living in a rural area, you know, you shouldn't develop this property, you shouldn't extract from the earth, you shouldn't be able to send your kids to college, you shouldn't be able to retire, you shouldn't be able to have a decent home because you need to protect the earth and that's your responsibility. I think they would say to you, no thank you, I'm going to take a different path. Even indigenous people, I mean, my tribe is an oil and gas producing tribe because that's what we've had to do to survive. And I think um, really kind of getting at those core issues, um, not thinking about it as good yeah. versus evil, yeah. but thinking about it as what do we all need to do to ensure that we will survive, flourish, and be resilient, and how can we do that in a way that is synced up with our obligation to Mother Nature? What a beautiful answer. Well, let me open up the floor. Um, can I just say one thing? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. First of all, yeah. I think you, all of you can understand why it's so important for Carla to be here, just hearing her and understanding what she's been through and what she's done. Um, I just want to take, say one thing quickly. I actually went to visit Charles Taylor yeah. about 20 years ago to confront him in Liberia, and that's a total different story, and it was quite an interesting story. Um, but the first time I went to the Valle de Javari, um, I was in a longhouse with one of these, with a community of people that had first had contact four or five years ago, um, four or five years prior with the outside world. And they were still living their traditional life, um, and they were angry. They were angry because their kids were being shot. And, uh, and they asked me, um, everybody comes in, they take our pictures, and, and then they leave. Like, how do I know you're going to come back? Mm -hmm. 
And it kind of gets to your question about good versus, it, it gets to a little bit of a history. My response, and which I hadn't thought of before when I was listening to this man, he was basically naked with a massive war club and he was pissed. And he was pounding the ground with his war club. Um, um, I said to him, my parents, I'm a first generation survivor. You know, my grandparents didn't leave. And so you have a sense of, of, of this is a dangerous place and we need to be allies. Mm -hmm. There's an urgency and an importance of that. And we have to really embrace that. And I think every person here who's had a journey that, that brings you here to this room, you're making a choice. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's good right there. And, and that's what we need to be doing, yeah. finding those allies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, Alessandra. I think we have a mic coming, though. Don't ask yet, because we want to capture it for eternity on, uh, on the web. Well, first of all, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure listening to you. And I have so much love and admiration for what you're doing. I just wanted to, um, my question would be, two weeks ago, as you said, two beautiful men were killed in Brazil. Unfortunately, it happens every day. I think the only reason why it even made the international headlines was because it was a British foreign correspondent, which doesn't diminish the tragedy that it is, but it is something for us to think about when we talk about allyship um, and how, how much of our bodies are on the line as allies, not just our ideas and our resources, but our physical bodies. Um, but my question was, just two days after their disappearance, um, President Biden met with Bolsonaro for the very first time. Mm -hmm. Bolsonaro and his wife were invited to the White House and they were here and in the sort of right-wing networks of Brazil, in the pro-Bolsonaro networks, all you could see were pictures of Biden shaking hands with Bolsonaro and Joe Biden having lunch with the First Lady of Brazil. And it really made it difficult for those of us who are in Brazil trying to be advocates for this cause to make a point that for Brazilians at least is a powerful point, which is you can't get away with killing people at the front lines, killing indigenous people, killing allies, killing um, activists, and still be a part of an international community. If you do this, you'll be a pariah, but then they did it and they're not a pariah. So I guess my question is, what can we do collectively here in this country to make these acts of war be perceived as what they are, acts of war, not only on us Brazilians, but on the planet, really, because that's what they were doing there, trying to protect this planet. What are the ideas that you have? Is anyone doing that right now? I think the question that you're asking is a really important one, and I think it really goes to um, the lack of remedies for grave violations of human rights. Um, I watched the other day on a YouTube video, um, Eleanor Roosevelt's speech when the Universal Declaration on Human Rights was passed by the United Nations, the General Assembly, um, in 1948. And I, I was really saddened by the amount of hope um, coming out of that declaration. That declaration actually was drafted in response to the atrocities of World War II. Um, the idea was that this can never happen again. And here we are. You know, and it's happening, and we have the president of this country meeting with the president of the country where that happened, and 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 it's really unfortunate. But it's been a long path to get to this place, and um, we have the um, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People that was passed by the General Assembly in 2007, and then codified by the United States in 2010. It took 25 years. It did, and. And not only did it take that long, and and you know, indigenous people from all over, um, you know, very rural areas of the globe came to participate in those negotiations. Some of them died before it was even passed. Um, there's no remedial mechanism in in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and so, for all of the articles that it has. Um, and all of the different ways that those articles can be violated, there is not a remedial mechanism. And I think um, until we get to a place where we take human rights seriously um, with, with remedies that actually have teeth, um, 
you're going to see things like this. And, and you know, President Zelensky is, as I understand it, speaking at 2.30 right after this um, here at the festival, uh, I assume yep. via video. <laughs> um, but, he, you know, what is going on there? I mean, there, there, you have this whole situation and you also have, you know, a, a real lack of, of honest, uh, Western intervention, I think, but some intervention. And so it's like, how do you get to a point where these things are being remediated? Mm -hmm. And I, and that's the, that's the big question. Um, to Peter's point, there is a really, really important um, part of the toolkit that does include companies. And so what I've done in a lot of my work is to really pressure the, the financial and corporate sector to be accountable because it feels to me at this moment in time that that accountability and that potential for remediation is greater in the capitalist structures than it is in the governmental structures. And that is, I know, a very large statement to make, but I think it's the world that we live in, so. It happens to be a comment that's been made quite a bit across this, this festival. Uh, let's, let's go to Nikki next, and we have a couple minutes, so maybe we can get to a third question also. Well, thank you all so much, and thank you so much, Dan, for leading an amazing conversation that is very much needed at Ideas Fast and providing a platform that means so much. Um, you know, you had talked about, Peter, about being in relation and the importance of being in relation with all of these things. And something at the Center for Native American Youth that our young people tell us is that a reminder that everything is interconnected and intersected. So when we're talking about saving our earth, we're also talking about preserving our culture, preserving our language, protecting our elders, addressing violence against Native women. And so I wonder, Carla and Peter, can you talk about how that interconnectedness and intersection of different issues shows up in your work that you're doing? Sure. At, at, at Neotero, we have a a Part of our DNA is indigenous ways and means. And every single person involved shares that conversation. Uh, it's led by a, uh, a woman, a Buryat woman from, from Russia, Mongolia, um, and by a Cherokee man. And so that shows up. And, that's, and when we look at the support and the engagement and the partnership with, with over 200 partners from different parts of this world, indigenous leaders and partners and communities. Um, our support goes to their re self-determined requests for help in securing culture, language, health, territory. And, and when w I speak to our board and listen to our board, which is dominated by indigenous women, the chair is an indigenous woman, what they say, the biggest threat that they see frame, uh, facing their territories and their cultures is the colonization of their educational systems. Mm -hmm. It's that their language, their, the courses are not being taught in their own language and it's not being framed around their own culture. The trio people in Suriname are taught their lessons since to a Dutch colony in Dutch about ice skating in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, so our effort is actually to, to kind of address it in all those different ways. Uh, plus one. Um, <laughs> and I would also just share a story that one of our grantees in California, um, Chair Valentin Lopez of the Ama Mutsun Band, um, told us uh, last year. So the Ama Mutsun Band of, of Mission Indians in California is a state recognized tribe. And uh, they were. Uh, subject to the to the violent um, displacement and colonization of the California mission system, um, and he went to a mission school as did his parents. Um, they were punished for speaking their native language. They were not allowed to practice their culture. This is a very common story that obviously is still being perpetuated throughout the world. And in, um, in his life, through acts of resilience and survival, um, he continued to uh, practice his culture as, as best he was able and really work to support his people and then emerged to be a tribal leader. And um, California lights on fire uh, multiple times a year, um, as you all know. And the California State Parks Department um, approached the Ama Mutsun Band about their traditional practices of controlled burning. 
and they invited uh, Chairman Lopez and some youth to come and, and to help them with, with controlled burning efforts. And so um, as part of that engagement, um, they were having these dialogues with the state parks people and they said, um, well, we, you know, we don't quite know what that plant is over there. Can you tell us what it is? And he said, I don't know what that plant is. And they said, oh, well, can you tell us in your native language what, what, you know, how you talk about controlled burning? And he said, I don't speak my native language. And it was really an inflection point um, for him that so much had been lost. So much also remained, again, the flip side of these things but that a lot of attention needs to be paid to what's been lost and also what needs to be preserved in order for what remains to strengthen. And we have really taken that to heart across our programs. Um, if a tribe or an indigenous community says we need to fund a language nest, our focus is really on land rights and territorial governance. But if they say that they need a language nest to, per to pursue that, then that is what we are going to offer. And again, that's part of um, supporting self-determination and offer and practicing trust-based philanthropy, but also really recognizing the intersectional and holistic cosmology of the people that we serve. Uh what a wonderful way to draw our formal uh, discussion to a close. Uh, Carla Fredericks, Peter Seligman, thank you so much for your work and for being here with us. Thank you all.